So the last but never least uh, speaker for this session is uh, Sasha Rosnil. And um, so uh, Sasha, she is currently Professor of Sociology and Social Theory at Birkbeck, University of London, and Director of the Birkbeck Institute for Social Research. Uh, she has been very, very recently uh, appointed uh, Executive Dean uh, for the world leading Faculty of Social Sciences at University of Essex, uh, which she will join from the 1st of September onwards. And uh, we're also very, very happy to have her here. So, Sasha. Well, thank you very much, Christina, and intimate colleagues. Um, first of all, for inviting me to speak here, um, because I've followed the germination of the intimate project over some years, and here it is, flourishing in its amazingness, um, and uh, declaring its presence all over the town, and gathering us together for what I think is already an incredibly unusual and momentous uh, discussions. But I have to admit that when Christina first asked me to be the intimate consultant or an intimate consultant on lesbian coupledom, I was a bit taken aback. But I don't work on lesbian coupledom, I thought to myself. I don't do coupledom, my contrarian self said. My work has been on feminist, lesbian, gay, queer communities and social movements, on collectives, publics, politics, identities and their transformation. And in my research on relationships, I'd like to think of myself as specialising in all that is beyond the couple on the queer, the counter-normative, the unconventional. I do couples other. It's critique. It's outside. I foregrounded the lives and struggles of those who are single, those who are living in living apart relationships against the norm that fuses coupledom and cohabitation. Those who are sharing homes with people they have no biological, sexual, or legal relationship with. Lesbians, gay men and bisexuals, yes, absolutely, but rarely the steadily, securely coupled up ones. I've concerned myself through a long-standing interest in practices of care with the provision of welfare with those who don't have a partner alongside them in times of need in mind, as still is assumed by welfare regimes of every type. And this research has pointed to the importance of friendship in the lives of those who live outside conventional couples and families and a determination amongst many, often having been profoundly hurt when a couple relationship has ended, to decenter the couple relationship in future, not to put all their eggs in one basket again. So I've studied both conscious, chosen, positive projects to live lives beyond dyadic and nuclear family formations, and lives that somehow lead to or move through such formations, sometimes with sadness, regret and a sense of loss. So against this background, just the very idea of lesbian coupledom as a thing, let alone being a consultant on it, sent a bit of a shudder down my spine. A feeling rather like, I think, that which makes the hackles on the back of a cat rise. To try to recapture that moment, it was a body feeling of unsettlement, of something I might describe as aesthetic distaste. Not quite as strong as repulsion, but that produced a powerful, if fleeting, desire to turn away from the source of discomfort, to disavow it. Lesbian coupledom, that's not me. <laughs> Yet, as I registered this reaction and I began to try to make sense of it, the word that came to mind to describe this body feeling was uncanny. Which, drawing on Freud, I understand as encompassing a sense of something disturbingly unknown and unassimilated scary in its otherness, yet also at some, strangely, at some level strangely familiar and recognisable. In his 1919 paper, Das Unheimliche, translated as The Uncanny, Freud discusses how the German word heimlich refers both to that which belongs to the house, that which is familiar, tame, intimate, comfortable, homely, and, now bizarrely to some readers, perhaps, but understandably to those of us who are imbued with a feminist critique of the privatisation of domestic life, it also refers to that which is concealed, kept from sight, so that others do not get to know about it, withheld from others, from the word geheim, secret. And unheimlich refers to that which is uneasy, eerie, blood-curdling. According to the philosopher Schelling, it is, quote, the name for everything that ought to have remained hidden and secret and has become visible. So Freud says, we, quote, find that among its different shades of meaning, the word heimlich exhibits one that is identical with its opposite, unheimlich, 
What is heimlich thus becomes to be unheimlich. Now the identification of this paradoxical doubling back on itself of experience and meaning seems to capture something vital about the uncanny. What Freud calls that class of the terrifying which leads back to something long known to us, once very familiar. And he goes on to elaborate a theory in which the uncanny is, quote, in reality nothing new or foreign, but something familiar and old established in the mind that has been estranged only by the process of repression. Now what does all this about Freud and the uncanny have to do with lesbian coupledom? And why does my reaction to Christina's request to act as the intimate consultant on lesbian coupledom, which I did actually accept in the end, um, <laughs> matter enough to make it the focus of this talk? Well, some of you of a more psychological bent might be thinking that my invocation of Freud is a telltale sign that this was my personal problem, my own repression, a bursting forth of internalised lesbophobia, glad we're both using that concept, um, or a working through of deeply buried issues about the couple form rooted in my own experience of what couple therapists call the internalised parental couple, all of which might be a very real concern to me, um, my partner, but surely aren't of much interest more generally. To which I would reply, yes, I believe my own psychic life has a part to play in this, but we're not really going to go there. Um, <laughs> but I invoke Freud not as a down-the-line psychoanalyst who believes that Freud has all the answers, but rather from a psychosocial perspective, which emphasises the fundamental entanglement of the psychic, which we might understand psychoanalytically, and the social, which we might understand sociologically and which stresses the inseparability of that which is experienced as most intensely personal and singular from wider collective, cultural, historical and spatial contexts and processes. A psychosocial perspective suggests that an anecdote of personal experience, however seemingly singular and unique, is never just that. It always speaks of more than just the person whose experience is being described. It speaks of the biography of that person, of the history of her relationships, from earliest object relations out of which subjectivity is constituted, through family and peer relations in childhood, into adult relationships in their diversity and complexity. And it also speaks of her culture and community, of their histories, and of the wider time and place in which the experience took place. So please bear with my confessional train of thought a little longer. Registering the uncanniness of my involuntary reaction to Christina's invitation. I was reminded of how for many years in my personal life I used to talk of the C word. This was an attempt at humour, light-heartedly acknowledging my struggles, which were always both personal and political, with a concept that unsettled me, a word that I joked I was actually unable to speak, couple. But I was actually no longer in this emotional place anymore, and hadn't been for many years when Christina's request came through, might be part of an explanation of why it provoked an uncanny re-encounter with my profound uneasiness about the idea of lesbian coupledom. This was an uneasiness that had for many years animated and shaped my relentless attempts to conduct research on intimate life that sought to find the outer edges of counter-normativity and criticality, at least where I perceived those edges to be at that time, and of course the edges constantly move but with which I have, I admit, become increasingly dissatisfied. Now, I'm fascinated by the things that it's difficult to talk about, the things that we find hardest to speak out loud, to formulate in words, to give voice to, both to ourselves, in our closest relationships, and in public. The things that, in their unspokenness, their silence, their hiddenness, nonetheless make their presence felt, pushing at the boundaries of self and society, producing intensely powerful feelings, eruptions into conscious experience that can be disturbing and unsettling of a psychic or social equilibrium that has been achieved by the, that, that very unspokenness, silence or hiddenness. So I want to think about my lesbian C word, which is not just my lesbian C word. And in so doing, I'll point to the existence of some other lesbian C words, because there are many. Historically, the figure of the lesbian couple has long been a troubling one. In complex and contradictory ways, both for mainstream culture and within certain strands of lesbian and queer culture and community. <coughs> for the mainstream, the lesbian couple makes visible, pushes into consciousness, the culturally troubling reality of sex between women, of sex without a man, in a way that the single lesbian, a woman alone, does not, rupturing the heteronormative equilibrium. 
The lesbian couple suggest there might be pleasures attached to the practice of lesbianism, and indeed there might be a way of living that offers sustained ongoing intimacy without a man. In this, then, the figure of the lesbian couple challenges one of the most fundamental cultural tropes about lesbianism, at least in British culture, that of the lonely lesbian. The idea that embarking on a lesbian life means plunging into a well of loneliness, if not immediately in the first flush of lesbian desire, ultimately and inevitably, because lesbian relationships are not sustainable, because they occupy a dead end, a non-reproductive space outside the regenerating heterosexual family, and hence outside the social. Paradoxically then, the figure of the lesbian couple both domesticates and publicizes lesbian relationships. The lesbian couple is both heimlich and unheimlich. And therein lies much of its disruptive power, even as cultural representations of lesbian couples have become much more widespread in recent years. In the lesbian community of the 1980s, formed in angry opposition to mainstream culture, suffused with feminism, and in a loud and passionate anarchist strain which prefigured riot girl and queer activism, and that's recently been given the label Rebel Dykes by Sean Rose in her forthcoming film. Through this subcultural community, there was a profound ambivalence about the lesbian couple form. And I should acknowledge this was the culture of my coming out. At a time before there were lesbian characters in mainstream popular culture, other than the tragic Sister George, before there were any respectable lesbians in public or cultural life, when the L word was rarely ever spoken out loud in polite society, identifying lesbian couples in history was a significant community preoccupation. Books were written and passed between friends, and plays performed about Radcliffe Hall and Una Trowbridge, Natalie Barney and Romaine Brooks, Virginia Woolf and Vita Sackville West and various other permutations of the Bloomsbury group. Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas. You'll notice quite a few of them are triangulated by dogs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the wonderful poodle that Gertrude and Anna couldn't resist. Anyone who knows me will know why there's a poodle in that. Um, their lives pressed into service in a project of collective cultural imagining of the possibility of lesbian relationships within a wider culture that denied any such possibility. But there were not many stories of lesbian couples that could be easily unearthed, and those that could be were overwhelmingly members of cultural and economic elites, because it was they who left records for the emerging field of lesbian history to find, and it was women of the cultural and economic elite who were more able to survive economically and socially without being attached to the income and social standing of a husband. So the 1980s was a time of yearning for positive images of lesbian couples, especially when at the dec end of the decade any representations of lesbian or lesbians or gay men's pretended family relationships were outlawed by Section 28 of the Local Government Act. But simultaneously there also existed amongst many lesbian feminists and rebel dykes a profound critique rooted in the politics of women's liberation of privatised domesticity, of relationships that might be thought to mimic heterosexuality, and of anything that might seem to pretend to family, all of which were seen as divisive of lesbian collectivity. The lesbian utopia, the lesbian nation, would be built by an army of lovers, not by couples and families. Non-monogamy was valorised and indeed normative in many lesbian circles. Settling down with a partner, let alone buying a house together, was regarded as the ultimate sellout and as being deeply uncool. That's the wrong slide. Um, indeed, being cool about your relationship was de rigueur. Never let it look like she means too much to you was one of the unspoken rules of 1980s lesbian life. And above all, being coupley was something to be avoided at all costs, even to the extent that ignoring your lover when out for the night at the same party or bar was preferable to be seen exchanging intimacies because coupliness excluded those without partners, marginalised friends, and undermined its sisterly solidarity and political community. At Greengate, one of the camps of the Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp, which was established in 1981 to resist the installation of NATO nuclear weapons in Britain, and which became for many years a focal point of community and politics for lesbians from across Europe and beyond, a collection of women who were in long-term or longish term couple relationships built their benders for two, these were temporary abodes made from plastic sheets or tarpaulin draped over uh, bent trees, some way away from the centre of camp life, up what was called Monogamy Mountain. 
Whilst the unattached and transiently attached and the straight women clustered their large collective tents and, and benders around the campfire, and often in the summer slept in their Gore-Tex bags in heaps of bodies alongside and wrapped around each other under the stars. One group of three women, recent graduates of fine art and drama, who were for a time wildly in love with each other and bursting with the delight of it, enacted what I would now see as a piece of queer performance art in which they were married to each other by a fourth woman who presided with great solemnity in the face of the hilarity of the brides and their guests. This playful mock wedding, the women explained, was never meant as anything other than a momentary celebration of their three-way relationship and a wry commentary on sexual politics, certainly not as a statement about long-term commitment. Yet, at the same time, and right to the present, a joke that is sometimes attributed to American comedian Leah Delaria circulated in British lesbian communities, and we've already heard it uh, uh, alluded to. Question, what does a lesbian bring on a second date? Answer, a removal van. <laughs> this joke and its popularity gestured towards, as jokes often do, a truth that it was hard for lesbian feminists and rebel dykes to acknowledge. That whatever the strength of the political discourse that critiqued monogamy as a patriarchal institution that seeks to control women's capacity for free love and unbounded sexuality, and that works against communal bonds and the radical remaking of society, there was also a reality that as social prohibition diminished and the economic possibility of living without a man expanded, more and more women were setting up home together as couples, sharing expenses and seeking to build lives together. Increasingly, as the 1980s gave way to the 90s, more and more had children together, and by the 2000s, when legal recognition was possible for their coupledom, they sought that recognition. So when civil partnerships were introduced in Britain in 2005 and same-sex marriage nine years later, the product of many years of campaigning by an increasingly reform-oriented lesbian and gay movement, tens of thousands of lesbians took up the possibility of legal and cultural recognition of their relationships. And rather, as Gracia said, uh, it started off, it was much more popular amongst men, but now the numbers have evened up and there are actually slightly more women getting married than men. This disjuncture, sorry, um, a domestication of lesbianism that was never imagined in earlier decades um, took place. This disjuncture between a collectively articulated normative political discourse about the right way to be a lesbian in order to build a better world and actual modes of living and loving continues today, with, if anything, the gap between the theory and the practice widening ever further, as queer theory has become institutionalised in the academy in a way that lesbian feminism and rebel dykedom never were in the 80s and 90s. Despite all its protestations of its fundamental anti-normativity, queer theory is shot through with normativity, the normativity of anti-normativity, as Robin Wigman and Elizabeth Wilson so powerfully discussed in their recent special issue of Differences. And with the critique of homonormativity and homonationalism now seemingly the sine qua non of global queer theory, the decisions of couples to be sexually exclusive, to cohabit and buy a house, and above all to seek state and cultural recognition of their relationships, are positioned as capitulation to or active embrace of dominant structures of power and cultural norms, and rendered deeply uncool, just as they were in the 1980s. Cutting-edge criticality sets itself radically apart from the normal. Now, it might be said that I exaggerate both the potency and ubiquity of influence of historic lesbian feminist, rebel dyke, and contemporary queer theoretical critiques of the couple form. Perhaps. Certainly I'm not claiming that the mass of ordinary lesbians, in inverted commas, live their lives in dialogue with these, these critiques. Women who are relatively or completely unengaged politically, who care little for the publications of only women or Duke University presses, who are unaware of how their lifestyles are the subject of disapproval amongst a critical cadre of artists, writers and theorists. For sure, the majority seem to pay little heed of how lesbian feminists, rebel dykes or queer theorists think they should live their lives. But nonetheless, the normative positionings of these critical theorists, th thinkers matter profoundly then and now across the nuances of differences between them because they capture something of the very real tension that exists, not just for lesbians or queers, but throughout the social formation between coupledom and community, between dyadic bonding and the group, between private and public ways of being and places of investment. And they also point to contradictions that are at the heart of lesbianism as a sexual identity. 
Because lesbianism, if it is a thing, and I haven't even touched upon that question, which is one for another day, must surely always be the naming of sex, love, intimacy between two women. And it must also always simultaneously speak of this as a shared identity that reaches beyond the space carved out by that couple. Because it's in the creative space of tension between couple and community that full intimate citizenship will be forged. If intimate citizenship is to be an expansive relational practice of participation, membership and belonging, rather than the bestowing of liberal individualistic rights by the state. To conclude briefly then, I'll return to where I started, to the uncanniness of the lesbian couple. A figure simultaneously familiar and strange, conjuring the putatively familial and the foreign, paradoxically domesticating and publicising of sex, desire, love and lives beyond the heteronormative, and more than a little disturbing in these contradictions. And I leave you with a programmatic challenge for the study of queer partnering, for querying, querying research on partnering, which is that we should, in our work, always pay heed to that which unsettles us, to that which might be the subject of too easy normative critique, especially of the anti-normative variety. Because it's in the contradictions, the complexities, and the things that we struggle to speak about that the contribution of queer research lies.